Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. October is going to be a very exciting month in the U.S. in regards to COVID vaccines. The FDA is going to look at boosters for Moderna, boosters for J&J &J vaccine. They're going to look at extending that EUA for Pfizer vaccine down to five years of age, so five to 11-year-olds. How soon they'll start immunizing kids after that EUA approval would probably be within a couple of weeks. Along with the prospect of vaccinating children, there are other signs of progress in the fight against COVID-19. We have a lot of reason for optimism here. We're gonna see approval of an oral antiviral. We're gonna see extensions and I hope mix and match allowances. And we're already seeing the value of people getting immunized and the downturn in the pandemic. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on Monday, October the 11th, 2021. Well, the cold weather is looming and experts are encouraging people to continue to get vaccinated as we're beginning to move back indoors because of the cold weather. Soon, those eligible to be vaccinated may include children ages five to 11. Here with us to discuss today is our expert, Dr. Greg Poland from the Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Greg. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Thank you. It was an early start to the day today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that we just are continuing your day while you're in, in keeping going. Greg, can you tell us what's going on with kids and the EUA or the emergency use authorization request by Pfizer to yeah. vaccinate them? October is going to be a very exciting month in the U.S. in regards to COVID vaccines. On the 14th of this month, the FDA is going to look at boosters for Moderna. On the 15th, boosters for J&J &J vaccine. And on the 29th of October, they're going to look at extending that EUA for Pfizer vaccine down to five years of age, so five to 11-year-olds. This is coming uh, a little faster uh, than we thought, which is which is good. Wonderful. How soon they'll start immunizing kids after that EUA approval, and I'm guessing they'll get that approval, would probably be within a couple of weeks. Notably, the the recommendation is shaping up to look like for five to eleven year olds, they'll get a ten microgram dose rather than a thirty microgram okay. dose. So they'll get a third of the dose that people 12 and older get. Well, that is exciting news, Greg. It, I was thinking about before how you told us how much paperwork goes into these oh, meetings yeah. uh, where you review all of this data. And I thought, well, that's a lot for people to read in a month. It really is. And, you know, maybe not too surprising, these younger kids getting uh, a third of the dose just have superior immune responses. They, oh, their, their, their young, healthy immune systems really uh, rev up in response to the vaccine. So they'll do very well, I think. Oh, that's great. Such good news since uh, we are more indoors at this time of year. Indeed. And, you know, with school starting, we've certainly seen uh, surges in, in different areas. We're concerned you know, about this, this rough pattern that has occurred since the start of the pandemic of every two, three months a surge, then it lets up a while, everybody relaxes, and that sparks another surge. And school is one of those, particularly with the Delta variant. So I'm really, really happy that we're going to be able to protect kids. Greg, what do we know about the demand for booster shots? Are those who are eligible to get them getting them? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been uh, a lot of movement in that direction uh, where, we, where we're not seeing movement. And that's really the concerning part is, unlike other nations, we've got a really large segment of people who are hesitant or resistant to getting the vaccine. So on the one hand, you've got a large uh, percent of America that's now moving to their, to their booster dose, uh, kids that will get their primary series, and then this group of people that will continue to periodically have infection and drive uh, these these surges and these outbreaks, and it's a uh, it's an almost intractable problem unless unless you make mandates. Greg, one of the most interesting things that I think 
I've heard is going on in research is this thought about mixing different COVID vaccines. Now, currently, if you had Pfizer, you'd get another Pfizer. If you can get a booster, you'd get a Pfizer. Um, what about um, people getting different um, brands of vaccines or types? Yeah, of that, that so-called mix and match idea is also yeah. going to be reviewed by the FDA, I, I, I think, again, on, that, on the 29th uh, of October. I've, I've been privy to those preliminary data. All I can say, or, or I'm allowed to say, is that looking at those data, it works. You see, you see really nice immunogenicity. You do not see any significant increase in reactogenicity or safety issues. So I suspect it will be approved. That will be very helpful for travelers, for clinicians, as you know, you and I are faced all the time by patients and often because of where we work, patients that have come from other countries using vaccines that, for example, maybe AstraZeneca vaccine mm -hmm. that we don't have here in the U.S. And, and I think it will be very, it's a very practical thing to be able to say you can mix and match these vaccines. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting news. Yeah. Convenient, I would think. Indeed. Um, Another study I wanted to ask you about, Greg, was in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they talked about how immunity in men may wane faster than it does in women after Pfizer vaccine. Tell me I, about that. I knew you were going to bring this up, Holly. <laughs> yeah, I think you're. I you're couldn't pass up an opportunity, Greg. <laughs> okay. I think you're uh, referring to the uh, Israeli healthcare worker study. It was just published in the New England Journal, as you mentioned, and, and it is interesting. You're exactly right. What they showed is that in men, antibody decayed or waned faster, significantly faster than in women. It also waned faster in people over the age of 65 and in people who were immunocompromised. None of that is a surprise, I, I have to admit to you, Helena. I've studied vaccines for 40 years, and in every vaccine that I have studied, women have superior immune responses to men. They just do. Um, we don't know precisely why that is. Um, I know you and my wife have offered an explanation, but it's not a scientific one. So we'll Sometimes leave that. no explanation is required, Greg. <laughs> but, you know, I think that the point is that uh, as, as, as I have written about uh, for, for uh, almost two decades now, in time, we're going to move toward a more personalized or individualized vaccinology approach. It may well mean, for example, that men need a booster sooner than women, or maybe it's at least older men need a booster uh, before uh, older women do. Those are the kinds of things that having data like this would enable. It also fits with the clinical picture that we see. Men have uh, suffered more in this pandemic than women in terms of hospitalization, deaths, oh, et cetera. Really? So, you know, it, it, it does fit with, with the clinical data. And then it's incumbent on us to design policy around that. What's the status of the Merck antiviral pill? Well, this is another area that's exciting. I mean, it, it's going to turn out that the fall here is, uh, is, a, is good news it is. It's <laughs> in very terms exciting. of this uh, pandemic. So uh, molnupiravir is the name. It's a mouthful of the antiviral. The dose is going to be two pills taken twice a day for, I can't remember now, is it four or five days? I think four days. We don't know yet how low of an age you'll be able to use it in. So, so don't have that information yet. But the exciting thing is that it cut the risk of hospitalization and death by 50, 5 0, 50 percent. Uh -huh. So, you know, like all antivirals, it's not a miracle cure, but the earlier you get to that infection and treat it um, makes a significant difference. Now, why are we so excited about this over the antiviral we have or monoclonal antibodies? This is oral. All the rest have to be administered by injection or IV infusion. So, so you can this, take this at home, perhaps. You can take this at home. And the, and the nice part about this is this kind of fits with the same paradigm that we already have in clinical medicine with treatment of influenza with an antiviral. Oh. 
With influenza, in fact, we now have an option where you take one pill one time. Uh, we're not there yet with COVID-19, but who knows uh, as, as more research occurs. So this is very exciting news to be able uh, to treat people who develop COVID, regardless of whether they got vaccine or not, as an outpatient and decrease that you know, surge demand that we have seen uh, on the medical system. Greg, is it known yet if that antiviral would be used in conjunction with monoclonal antibody, for instance? Yeah, there probably wouldn't be a need to simultaneously okay. uh, do that. Now, now potentially, you know, you could, you could envision maybe some clinical scenarios uh, where you're sort of throwing everything at the fire mm -hmm. uh, to, see, to see what would help. But the antivirals tend to work best the earlier that they're used. So you really don't want to wait until somebody's you know, on a ventilator in the ICU. And, and again, that's the value of this as an oral outpatient treatment. So the earlier you know, the better. It right. sounds like when you have a- Right. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we don't know quite yet when this drug will come up before the FDA for review. Mm -hmm. I imagine pretty quickly since we already have the high level efficacy and safety data um, and almost certainly, unless there are any surprises, it would end up getting approved. Say, Greg, this is a little off topic from COVID, but I wanted to get your take on the malaria, the first ever malaria vaccine that the World Health Organization is endorsing. Tell yes. us about that. That sounds yeah. like amazing. Well, news. we will finally be able to eliminate malaria in Minnesota. <laughs> we have we have a cure for that in Minnesota. It's called winter. Uh, we don't have any mosquitoes. Right, and it's coming soon. We don't have mosquitoes then, but you're exactly right. There's a vaccine called the RTSS Mosquirix is what it's going to be called, uh, made by GSK. And uh, this is very interesting. Looks like it's going to be a four-dose series. Uh, again, significantly decreases uh, the risk of severe disease. We don't know about death but presumably it will cut the, the risk of death. In, you know, let's take Africa. You have Sub-Saharan Africa, you have 400, 500,000 kids a year who die of malaria. Now, this vaccine is probably only about 50% effective. So it's a start. Uh, mm -hmm. Some One study showed 30% efficacy. So it's a start. And it probably only lasts about four years. So uh, it's, not, it's not a panacea, but a very exciting new paradigm for a vaccine against a parasite. Parasites are very complex organisms. So this will be a vaccine against a parasite um, and for a, a, a pathogen that has ravaged the human population for centuries and centuries. So uh, this, is, this is very exciting news in the field of vaccines. That's great. Any uh, other thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners today? You know, I, I want to push a little bit, Helena, just because we have uh, seen some very, very sad cases nationally, and that is the importance of immunizing women who want to get pregnant or who are pregnant with COVID vaccine. And again, this has a double benefit. It protects the mom and it protects the child, both unborn and immediately after birth. In fact, I know this is going to sound almost unbelievable. The risk of death in a pregnant woman with COVID is 70% higher oh. than in a non-pregnant woman of the same age. And, uh, you know, by the way, we see similar kinds of statistics for pregnant women with, who develop influenza. So particularly that second to third trimester it's really important that a woman be updated with pertussis vaccine, COVID vaccine, and influenza vaccine. So it's also a reminder that in the midst of all the COVID information, there are important things you can do to protect your well-being, your health, and your life above and beyond COVID. And that's pertussis, shingles, pneumonia, influenza vaccines. Wow, I, I had no idea, Greg, that the risk of flu was high, so high. Yeah. 
We're yeah, in, like in pregnant women. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about a, a twindemic uh, last year, and I think I've mentioned before, now the concern is uh, over a tri or even quaddemic. Uh, what has happened is last year we saw almost no influenza. Right, I right. personally did not see a single flu case. That has never happened in my career. Never. But we were wearing masks. We were distanced at that time. By pretending that the pandemic is over, we've already seen more cases of influenza than we did all of last year. And we've seen surges in RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, which you know makes people sick, but it can kill young kids and elderly adults. So, and we don't have a vaccine against it. So we really do want to urge people, be careful here. You're going to hear news. And I think it's true that the COVID-19 pandemic is going to wane and it's going to, and it has waned quite a bit already in the last few weeks. It will wane further, but many predictive models concerned it's speculation, but based on what we had, the pattern we have seen over the last 19, 20 months, concern that as we get deeper into winter with travel, the holidays, et cetera, that we'll see another surge both because of the large number of unvaccinated people and waning immunity where you see breakthrough cases. So in summary, Greg, what are you thinking and feeling this month about the trajectory of COVID-19? Well, I'm, I'm really pleased. And as you can tell, I mean, there's some serious things to attend to, but we have a lot of reason for optimism here. I think we're going to see um, approval of a vaccine for kids down to age five, we're going to see approval of an oral antiviral. We're going to see extensions and I hope mix and match allowances for, for vaccines. And we're already seeing the value of people getting immunized and the downturn in the pandemic. I still have concerns about the people who are not immunized, but uh, I, I, think our, I think we can be very positive here, particularly as we get to the holidays. If people re will remember, what we said all along, hands, face, space, and vaccinate, and it will serve them well. Our thanks to Dr. Greg Poland for being here today to be our virology and vaccine expert and give us our COVID-19 updates. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish each of you a very wonderful day. And be safe, everyone. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts.